Good evening, everyone. I'm Johnny Singrish in Singapore, standing outside my shop in this building called Sutan Plaza. My shop name is called Spicy and Sexy Showcase. And if you're wondering why my headgear is so wacky and uh, funky and looks like the uh, Arab Aga or the uh, Japanese uh, tradition celebration wearing their headgear. And I also get inspiration from the Muay Thai fighter. Before they fight, they will perform the spiritual dance and the headgear looks something like this. Except without the tail. I'm filming this video with this gadget. It looks similar to this cylinder torchlight called Next Trails and Fun Gimarazi. Next means never ending extreme. Trails and Fun Gimarazi. X spelled as X T R E M E. First of my mm, camera, it is pointing at the front. It's called Mice to See You Killer Razi. Mice means mark is covert eye. And the world number one best for filming, for FBI filming, fun business I spy, is this yellow piece called. FBI reborn for anyone Fimorazi. And this one which I'm pointing, which I just explained, looks like this uh, torchlight. It's called Next Trails and Fun Gimarazi. And behind me is the fourth model and the latest of my four video pairs. It's called F to F Busy Chit Chat Memorazi. F to S F to F means face to face. And this butterfly is just to tell you your children can become their own National Geographic videographer. Next Trails and Funs got a very wide angle. And standing in front of my shop and I'm putting Next Trails and Funs Gimarazi about two feet away from my face and facing my showcase. Just look at the mannequin heads. They are strapped and secure with four video pairs starting from the first one. It is Filmo Razi, second Kilo Razi, third is Gamer Razi and the fourth is Memorazi. In the short wall, I'm going to film this video grab from YouTube. Stay put and just watch this reflection from my mirror. This is a mouse watch video grab from YouTube. I won't tell you what is it. For all ages, especially for children. And I'm placing Next Trail and Fun Gimarazi in front of my laptop, which is about 7 inches away from the screen. It has a wide angle lens, so it's able to capture from left to right. So sit back and relax and watch these 60 minutes of uh, high-tech uh, video, which is simply incredible, amazing, and awesome. Uh, sorry for my interruption. You can set the adjustment, the third icon, or the third symbol at the bottom bar. To 720, 480, or 360. Uh, 20 is HD because this video is filmed 
with very high quality in the HD, but sometimes you may get lagging in the audio. If it happens, then set to 480 or ideally to 360. In this case, I have uh, set it to uh, 720. Looks like audio is not lagging uh, badly uh, from this uh, video. So I'll continue now. So what does it mean for a machine to be athletic? We will demonstrate the concept of machine athleticism and our research to achieve it with the help of these flying machines called quadrocopters or quads for short. Quads have been around for a long time. The reason that they're so popular these days is because they're mechanically simple. By controlling the speeds of these four propellers, these machines can roll, pitch, yaw, and accelerate along their common orientation. On board are also a battery, a computer, various sensors, and wireless radios. Quads are extremely agile, but this agility comes at a cost. They are inherently unstable, and they need some form of automatic feedback control in order to be able to fly. So, how did it just do that? Cameras on the ceiling and a laptop serve as an indoor global positioning system. It's used to locate objects in the space that have these reflective markers on them. This data is then sent to another laptop that is running estimation and control algorithms, which in turn sends commands to the quad, which is also running estimation and control algorithms. The bulk of our research is algorithms. It's the magic that brings these machines to life. So how does one design the algorithms that create a machine athlete? We use something broadly called model-based design. We first capture the physics with a mathematical model of how the machines behave. We then use a, a branch of mathematics called control theory to analyze these models and also to synthesize algorithms for controlling them. For example, that's how we can make the quad hover. We first capture the dynamics with a set of differential equations. We then manipulate these equations with the help of control theory to create algorithms that stabilize the quad. Let me demonstrate the strength of this approach. Suppose that we want this quad to not only hover, but to also balance this pole. With a little bit of practice, it's pretty straightforward for a human being to do this, although we do have the advantage of having two feet on the ground and the use of our very versatile hands. It becomes a little bit more difficult when I only have one foot on the ground and when I don't use my hands. Notice how this pole has a reflective marker on top, which means that it can be located in the space. You can notice that this quad is making fine adjustments to keep the pole balanced. How do we design the algorithms to do this? We added the mathematical model of the pole to that of the quad. Once we have a model of the combined quad-pole system, we can use control theory to create algorithms for controlling it. Here you see that it's stable, and even if I give it little nudges, it goes back to the nice balanced position. We can also augment the model to include where we want the quad to be in space. Using this pointer, made out of reflective markers, I can point to where I want the quad to be in space a fixed distance away from me. The key to these acrobatic maneuvers is algorithms, designed with the help of mathematical models and control theory. Let's tell the quad to come back here and let the pole drop, and I will next demonstrate the importance of understanding physical models and the workings of the physical world.
Notice how the quad lost altitude when I put this glass of water on it. Unlike the balancing pole, I did not include the mathematical model of the glass in the system. In fact, the system doesn't even know that the glass of water is there. Like before, I could use the pointer to tell the quad where I want to be in space. Okay, you should be asking yourself, why doesn't the water fall out of the glass? Two facts. The first is that gravity acts on all objects in the same way. The second is that the propellers are all pointing in the same direction of the glass, pointing up. You put these two things together, the net result is that all side forces on the glass are small and are mainly dominated by aerodynamic effects, which at these speeds are negligible. That's why you don't need to model the glass. It naturally doesn't spill, no matter what the quad does. The lesson here is that some high-performance uh, tasks are easier than others, and that understanding the physics of the problem tells you which ones are easy and which ones are hard. In this instance, carrying a glass of water is easy, balancing a pole is hard. We've all heard stories of athletes performing feats while physically injured. Can a machine also perform with extreme physical damage? Conventional wisdom says that you need at least four fixed motor propeller pairs in order to fly, because there are four degrees of freedom to control. Roll, pitch, yaw, and acceleration. Hexacopters and octocopters with six and eight propellers can provide redundancy, but quadrocopters are much more popular because they have the minimum number of fixed motor propeller pairs, four. Or do they? If we analyze the mathematical model of this machine with only two working propellers, we discover that there's an unconventional way to fly it. We relinquish control of yaw, but roll, pitch, and acceleration can still be controlled with algorithms that exploit this new configuration. Mathematical models tell us exactly when and why this is possible. In this instance, this knowledge allows us to design novel machine architectures or to design clever algorithms that gracefully handle damage, just like human athletes do, instead of building machines with redundancy. We can't help but hold our breath when we watch a diver somersaulting into the water or when a vaulter is twisting in the air, the ground fast approaching. Will the diver be able to pull off a repentry? Will the vaulter stick the landing? Suppose we want this quad here to perform a triple flip and finish off at the exact same spot that it started. This maneuver is going to happen so quickly that we can't use position feedback to correct the motion during execution. There simply isn't enough time. Instead, what the quad can do is perform the maneuver blindly, observe how it finishes the maneuver, and then use that information to modify its behavior so that the next flip is better. Similar to the diver and the vaulter, it is only through repeated practice that the maneuver can be learned and executed to the highest standard. Striking a moving ball is a necessary skill in many sports. How do we make a machine do what an athlete does seemingly without effort? This quad has a racket strapped onto its head with a sweet spot roughly the size of an apple, so not too large. The following calculations are made every 20 milliseconds or 50 times per second. We first figure out where the ball is.